Hey guys, welcome to episode 27 of the Game Dev Discussion Podcast. I'm your host Alex Beddows and this is the official podcast of the Dynasty Empire. Today we have art director Lincoln Hughes on. How are we doing dude? I'm good. How are you? I'm good, thank you. I really appreciate you coming on. I know this is, uh, it's, do you say 8am over there for you? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's like 7.55. <laughs> um, dude, I really Five appreciate minutes taking... off. <laughs> dude, I am the worst. Even though, considering I work with people in like different time zones, I still haven't worked out time zones. I don't think I ever will. Um, yeah, same, same with me. <laughs> but I have to say, I've been really interested to talk to you because you're one of these rare breeds of people who is a boss 3D artist, technical guy, and Thanks. really proficient as a 2D artist. Like, how does that happen? <laughs> Uh, well, I don't know. I'd, I'd basically been drawing since I was, I was a little kid and, uh, yeah, I kind of just got, ended up getting into the game industry and, you know, through that you're kind of hanging out with all these people that, you know, have a plethora of different skills and, uh, skill sets. So yeah, just basically found the idea of being a concept artist, super, super easy or not, sorry, not easy, super, super cool. Like, uh, all the you know sci-fi stuff pretty much just anything in fantasy and sci-fi just drove me insane so i <laughs> uh, just started picking that up and then learning different techniques from all the people around me and uh yeah and then on top of that like my main kind of staple of my job was being an environment artist so um yeah just so ended what, up doing them both so it was definitely 2d that came first that was all of your first love for studio art uh yeah like it, that was more like a, a child fantasy mm-hmm. <laughs> a childhood fantasy kind of thing um and which i you know slowly developed over like i don't know 15 years kind of thing right mm-hmm. yeah. and then and then so you sort of you wanted to work into the games industry you naturally fell into 3d art i'm guessing it sort of went full circle you were working at 3d art for a while and then realized you could sort of come back around to concept art is that how it works? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Like my first job, I was doing uh, environment art, and then I expressed an interest in doing concept art, so mm-hmm. started doing that at work as well. And then there was probably like maybe a twelve-year hiatus on doing concept, and then you know recently, just over the past couple of years, like started to get back into it. And uh, yeah, like I got a job uh, teaching concept art at Sin Studio. Mm-hmm. And so that that was actually a really good learning experience because, you know, if, if you're going to be teaching something, you kind of need to know <laughs> what's going on with it. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I basically just practiced like every day for like, I don't know, like a year, six months to a year. And then, uh, you know, wrote a course for it. And just uh, that whole experience just taught me so much. So I think I... I gained like 10 levels (laughs) over like a year long period so yeah so on on your cv on your you have clearly you have an experience bar cv and you you've added 10 levels to experience bar and concept out there (laughs) yeah exactly yeah Um, i've become a paladin (laughs) (laughs) paladin dude what like how how have they influenced each other like or have they in fact like you know it might be a negative but they do but i can imagine this stuff you've picked up from 3d art which has influenced your concept art and vice versa could you explain any of that? Um, yeah, I, I'd definitely say that like the whole like 2D aspect has like really, really helped me uh, be an assistant art director. Mm-hmm. Uh, just because, you know, like it, you start to understand, like especially if you're painting, like you start to understand a lot better how light works and how light influences composition and colors and uh you know what what types of lighting setups you would want and what colors you want to use and how the palettes dictate the emotions of the viewer and you know and camera angles and all that and it you know if like if you're just doing like basic 3d modeling like a lot of the time you're just taking a look at a reference and trying to replicate something as opposed to like creating something but like you do that with 3d too but like it's you know like it's almost more like fundamentals of design like 2d stuff Mm -hmm. um i I guess it applies to both a little bit but uh i just found it 2d like helped me completely with with that whole side of things i think 2d's got an interesting thing where when i observe like 2d art a lot of it they sort of 
it's suggestive. You have to put enough detail in so that the viewer like fills in the gaps with their mind. Whereas with 3D, I find it far more literal. Like you, you literally put the details in. Like if it's a mech, you have to oh, yeah. pull every nut, every bowl, every you know pipe. Whereas the 2D is something I can appreciate. And it's something I can't do. So that's why I think I find it so interesting. Is it's so some concept has very vague or like there's no hard lines and hard detail. Yet you completely yeah. understand what you're looking at. Um, yeah, ex exactly. I can imagine that being a. I mean, can that help 3D? I suppose it helps with the composition. I just, it, I just find the world so different. It's a, it's crazy. Like, how do you even maintain? Like, do you have to consciously? 2D seems to be, sounds like it comes quite naturally to you. I know you said you did do um, a lot of um, training and stuff and uh, stuff of that nature, but did like. Do you have to set your time aside and I have to really focus on 3D right now and then I have to really focus on 2D? Because say for me, for example, I'm constantly always focused on 3D. I don't even think about 2D art. So I can't imagine having to separate myself like that. Yeah, I I don't know. I, I Like in my spare time, I kind of just do what I want. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like I, I like I like doing painting sometimes. I like doing technical stuff and unreal like it, I kind of just like a bunch of different things and then I, I devote like the time that I'm going to learn or like I'm not like specifically saying I need to learn that like right yeah. now I'm more like oh that looks really cool okay yeah I'm, <laughs> I'm going to learn that <laughs> you know I'm guessing also it's quite a good change of pace for you because I, I, I know like I enjoy say for example I make a lot of materials I enjoy the change of pace of doing something like design art or unreal shaders because it's a very different way of thinking compared to like being in substances um sorry compared to being in zbrush because it's just oh yeah two different sets of muscle memory two completely different ways you have to approach problems do oh, yeah. you get that as well you know you you when you start to get a bit fed up or you know tired on the technical side you could just switch over to 2d and it's like a breath of fresh air i imagine oh yeah yeah totally like in in my spare time like i do that all the time um at work, uh, like I, I just recently moved to uh, a smaller game studio. It's called Took, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, like I was at Warner Brothers right before this, and uh, they're like, like a, they're a, a really big company with like a, a ton of resources, and you know, like every every artist is kind of like, okay, I'm gonna do this kind of one thing. I do level art. I do textures. I do this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to Took where you're like a, a generalist. So mm -hmm. you kind of get to experiment and do a lot of different things at once, which uh, can be really stressful sometimes because <laughs> you don't know, like you're not a master at that one thing. Uh, but it's also like probably one of the best uh, learning experiences ever because like you're just thrust in the, into this pos position where like the entire production is relying on your unknown knowledge of this problem so you have to yeah. figure it out for yourself um so yeah it's i don't know like switching it up and being able to uh tackle problems as they come up in whatever different software whatever different sect of artistry um yeah i think that's that's a really good thing to do and it's it it's nice too like it, it's refreshing to you know, spend like a month of lighting on an environment after, you know, spending a month of doing materials like mm -hmm. it, you know, you don't get sick of it. You kind of get to try this new thing. You learn something different. It's yeah. Yeah, it's quite it's, it's great. Cause like, so for me, it's like I go between sort of 3D art and I'm quite, um, what's the word? I don't want to say business focused, but like I do take a keen interest in that side of stuff. And it's yeah. like, it's just a completely different challenge and problem. So you just like, you still have the same amount of energy as you did almost at the beginning of the day. So like, you, know, you finish your day, say you spent the whole day doing, say, like, 3D art or 2D art or business stuff, you come back, you do the other thing, and you still maintain your energy. Yeah, it's, it's oh, a, totally. It's a blessing. It's, a, it's an absolute blessing. But you mentioned um, the art director stuff. Could you, like, elaborate on what your day-to-day -day role is for you as an art director? Because there's two things of it. One, I don't think there's much... I don't want to call it transparency, but, like, the art director is quite a vague term, which isn't well formulated in a public eye, I don't think. You know, when when I say I'm a materials artist, you know exactly what I mean, and people sort of understand what a lead artist is and they understand what a principal artist is. I don't yeah. think there's that much clarity on what an art director is. And also it changes from studio to studio. So for you at the moment, could you just sort of like give a bit of um, information on what like, you know, you as an art director is? Uh, well, like 
if I was taking a textbook description of it, I'd say like they're basically responsible for making sure that every artist on the floor and not just artists, like every different department is kind of creating art that fits the specific art style uh, that the production dictates and making sure it, it all kind of flows together and tells the message of the narrative. So like you're, you're kind of just like you're working with all the different departments to make sure that everything kind of gels together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how, when well, what's the interaction then? So from that, you're doing that role. Do you interact purely with your team leads and they relay the message or do you sometimes interact with, you know, directly to the artists or the people doing the groundwork? Uh, I think it, it differs depending on the studio. Um, but for me, it's, you know, I'm, I'm kind of just like we, we only have one lead, sorry, we have one uh, environment lead, then we have me, then we have a narrative lead, and then, you know, it's it's like, it's a lot smaller of a studio, right? Like, I think mm -hmm. we have like maybe 10 artists, you know? Um, so yeah, I'm usually going around like one by one, like setting up little groups where we can review maps, give feedback, and then, you know, we get the narrative director in there and the gameplay director and the level design lead we all sit down and like brainstorm like all the best ways of how we could pass that message that i just talked about in terms of gameplay in terms of narrative in terms of lighting in terms of blah 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 right mm -hmm. um and yeah like a lot of it's giving feedback um but i i kind of like i really like doing the assistant art director gig but it's kind of nice to be able to actually do some art once in a while um yeah i was just about to ask that like it you obviously you spend your career being like a senior artist or um, concept artist and obviously it's a lot of production um do you get that so do you scratch that itch of doing the production side of stuff with personal work or do you as an art director because it's such a small studio and obviously you have to wear a lot of hats do you get a lot of opportunity to do the sort of production side of stuff uh i i actually i do hmm. at, at the studio like i think if i was at a bigger studio i'd have way less yeah like i wouldn't be able to to do that um but yeah yeah i definitely get some time to you know like right now i'm, I'm doing some level art for mm -hmm. one of our maps and doing some lighting and uh just basically like helping out on one of the the missions so it's it's nice right i get to do a little bit of everything but it, it's tough like it's like a balancing act especially if, if you're doing art like in the production side of things as well as art direction because uh if you don't devote most of your time to actually giving art direction to everybody, then, uh, you know, everything kind of suffers for it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, so you have to strike this weird balance between like doing like this whole set of work that you promised you'd do and then doing that whole other set of work that you mm -hmm. promised that you do. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a challenge. I bet it's quite a lot. Actually, think about it now when I'm thinking about that as a role. Like, I bet it's a lot of pressure, actually, when you're actually doing the art because I suppose when you're um, when you're a sort of senior or any other role other than art director, when you're creating art, you've always got someone who you're accountable to to say, no, you're doing it wrong or that's not quite right. I suppose if you're the art director and you're doing the artwork, you're accountable to yourself and that means... I imagine there's a lot of pressure there to make sure, like, I've got to get it right because there's... What's the word? You're the... I don't want to call it last line of defense, but you know what I mean? Like, you're the, the, the art director, so if well, it's wrong, who's, who corrects you? Like, just just to to correct you, I'm, I'm actually assistant art director. <laughs> oh, sorry, yeah, so, assistant. So, like, there actually is an art an art director. Sorry, okay. So, so I'm, I'm the second last line of defense. <laughs> right, right, follow you, follow um, you. Okay, well, that's interesting, though. So how, so how does that relationship work, then? Oh, it's, it's pretty cool. Like, I... I'll, I'll do art basically and I'm, I'm sitting right beside the art director so and uh, me and him we shoot the shit all day so he's like he's there and any question I have or like any validation I need I'm like hey man hey what's going on check <laughs> this out you know so um, yeah we, we just we basically just bounce ideas off off of each other and, and help each other out to uh, like we're both kind of filling that role of art director but um, he's kind of the one that makes the final decisions and mm -hmm. uh like he's he's more of uh, he's more of the creative brains behind the art direction, and I'm uh, more of like the technical brains behind the art direction. So like he'll basically have like an idea. Okay, I want to have this crazy thing in the background, and then I'll be like, okay, well, 
maybe we should spin that idea this way a little bit because if we do it that way then it's going to save us like a month of work (laughs) you know what i mean so it's it's yeah it's taking his like both of our ideas pretty much and trying to funnel them into something that is actually feasible in terms of scope in the production of our game Right, so he thinks, I'm guessing it's like he has these big abstract ideas and you need to take them abstract abstract ideas and sort of make them a reality in whichever way Uh, possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like like some of his ideas are just like, they're awesome ideas and you're just like, oh, okay. But it's (laughs) also like you're you're walking this tightrope of like, okay, well, like he has crazy ideas and I want to do them, but I don't know if I can, but Mm -hmm. I still want to push for the stars. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. it's like it's trying to trying to make it all work for everybody, and that's that's probably the most challenging thing of doing the job, right? Does um I know sometimes like with some studios with direct, uh, multiple directors or like you know assistant art directors or lead artists and their directors, there could be so I don't and I'm not going to call it conflict. You know, like bashing heads. Like someone has one idea and you have another idea, and you're sort of trying to work out the best resolution to it. Do you spend as an assistant art director with your art director? Do you spend much time like bashing heads going? Well, you have this idea, and I have this idea. How do we do something? Or do you two tend to? It tends to be quite smooth sailing. Uh, no, it's it's pretty smooth sailing. It's like yeah, it happens. Like mm-hmm. you're, I don't know. I like I I don't have that much experience being uh, in this role, right? Like I've only been doing it for a year, and mm-hmm. yeah, there's definitely been a couple times where I I bash heads with people and. But like it, it's all good, right? Yeah, like yeah. everybody like the the thing is like everybody has their perfect idea of what they want the game to be, right? Mm-hmm. And every department differs in terms of what their priorities are and uh you know what the most important things that they want to be in the game are. So it's like I think like yes you're going to bash heads with people, but I think if you walk away from the conversation feeling like okay, well like what's what's their crime like all they really wanted was to make a dope game yeah. <laughs> like that actually and then like oh, okay oh, okay and then you know if if there was like any residual anger like you just talk to them after be like ah oh, like i don't know man like i get it right like yeah we well, don't want to walk away from a conversation like feeling like you've won really like you don't want a winner and a loser you just want both people to walk away from the conversation like super happy because you've come to a great idea like that's what fun with games i mean with I suppose with business it's a bit different but like with games I feel like when you are bashing heads if both people who are having a diff- the, op- the opposition ideas can walk away absolutely thrilled with what the outcome is that's the ideal outcome you don't really want like my idea won and his last like cause that's just not the way it works um, yeah but I can't, I can't imagine like uh, as a, as an the techni- you know, like you're obviously your director, an assistant director, I should say, and you know you you give an art direction. Does the technical side of your brain, which understands pipelines and shaders and clever way of doing things, does that ever undermine the creative ideas? So the reason I ask is obviously there's limitations, um, and what you the way I see it is the art director has this great idea, and we got to make it feasible. And it's up to the teams to you know, make it happen. Does do you ever undermine an idea or sort of second guess yourself because you're like in your head you're already thinking about the technical solution to something and you're like, oh, that idea can't work because of X, Y, Z, or oh. do you leave that to someone else to figure out? Uh, well, like it, I think it depends on the complexity of the problem and um how much experience I have tackling the solution. So like, you know, like let's say we're talking about like cinematics, right, Mm -hmm. in the game. Like I I can't really make calls on, you know, what the best way to do cinematics are. Like, yeah, I can help with like cameras and like, okay, this is the type of camera angle we want. This is the lighting, the feeling that we want. But like when it comes to like the specifics of how the animation is going to play out and what props we need in the environment and how those props are actually going to affect the gameplay or the level design of the area that they take place in for the, the cinematic, um, I need I need an animation director there, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know? So like, yeah, it's it's just, it's complicated, but it's also, I think, just taking all of the technical knowledge and all the people that have that technical technical knowledge around you and using it to help you 
mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, like for your question, it yeah, yeah, it, it can. Sorry, can you can you say your so, question once more? So, I kind of like um, went, went on a side. No, 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 it's fine, it's fine. Um, so I'll, the reason I ask is it, basically if you have a creative idea, you you sort of this abstract creative idea. Um, if say if you're just a purely creative person who doesn't ha- have the technical understanding, you're like, I want to make this happen. And then you leave it to the technical people to make it happen. When you're someone who's sitting on both sides of the fence, um, do you ever sort of have an abstract idea or your director has an abstract idea and you are already thinking about a technical reason why something can't happen? Um, so the reason I, I ask is I say, for example, in my job, with, we have an engine Sometimes it could, oh, we have an idea, oh, it'd be really cool if we did this. And I'll say, oh, yeah, okay, it would be cool, but we can't do it for X, Y, Z reasons. Before we even really, like, exploring the idea. Does that ever happen where you're, you, know, you have this idea and you know a technical reason or you're sort of thinking about the technical limitations already before even exploring it? Does that ever happen? Uh, Yeah, yeah, it, it does. Like, it, you know, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of people coming up with ideas mm-hmm. and um, that's like, it's kind of the job of the creative director to be able to like take those ideas and, and prioritize them yep. for every department, right? Like what's, what's the, what's, what are the main four underlying pillars of, of the game? Right. And then like those ideas that come up, if they don't devote to like at least three out of those four pillars, like they should just be shot down immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, there's, there's some butting of heads over, uh, okay, this, this idea, this crazy idea that somebody had, yeah, it, it, it can be tough. Cause like, I don't know, you're, you're sitting there, you got, you got like, depending on the point in production, like, I think we had like five, five artists and, you know, you have 10 people coming up with ideas and, you know, you can't make every one of them. So yeah. like, it's just, it's a battle of like choosing which one is going to work and then trying to justify that idea to people in a way that uh, makes it so that their ideas or maybe you twist those uh, those the mm. scope of the project a little bit and the, the technical way that you approach those ideas in terms of how they need to get done in the game uh, so that they you know kind of flow with all the ideas that are being given yeah it's it's a tightrope man like you, you yeah. go back and forth right like you're like okay well this guy said i need to do this this guy said i i need to do this so like okay how do i meld the two ideas so that they work in terms of the the scope and you know it well, it is it's I it's a challenge you. I, i'll be honest because I, I that's the big problem oh, not problem but that's the for the people who are the directors and the leads you deal with people at the end of the day when people have ideas i mean you you never want to pull rank anyway like that's the last thing you want to do yeah, is go no. oh my, my idea trumps was because of rank whatever you don't want that so the the director i'm very lucky to have great directors in my studio but like um that's why i don't envy you guys because you've got to sort of deal with ideas and you sort of treat ideas as almost like a uh, what's the word a currency and you sort of have to remove the fact that it's come from a person and go is it a good idea yes or no no but we you can't just say oh no it's a bad idea you have to sort of work with it and explore it without dismissing someone's you know thought and i, I just don't envy you guys cause I, <laughs> I watch you guys do it and i'm like i just couldn't do that it's like and it's such a this is why i wanted to i'm really excited to have you on as an art director because it's something i don't think ground newer people to the industry understand or don't understand or don't appreciate you know it's not just sitting there telling people you do this and you do this and you do this it's hearing everyone taking everyone's ideas in understanding whether they're you know feasible or not how we can implement them and make sure everyone's heard yeah it's easy when you're like say a junior coming in just thinking as an art director they're telling you that everyone's ideas is bad and that's the way it is it just doesn't work like that but that that's something i think is very important for people to understand is that is i imagine quite a lot of your job is yeah sort of working with people yeah it's it's it you know, like everybody says that they don't want to do politics mm-hmm. in the workplace. And like, I'm totally one of those people. Like, I hate doing politics. I hate kind of, 
oh, I'm I'm gonna figure out a way to manipulate this guy into doing this idea. You know, like mm-hmm. I I don't want to think about that stuff. I have enough stuff to think about besides yeah. doing that. And uh, there actually is, you know, despite what some people may think, like in the background, there actually is a lot of politicking, right? Like mm-hmm. especially at the bigger companies, and like that's that can actually be a good thing if it's done properly. I was gonna say it is and, a good thing sometimes, isn't it? Oh yeah, yeah. It's not. It's not like it doesn't just mean like manipulation. It means like people kind of doing exactly what we were talking about, like taking those ideas and uh, figuring out a way to get input from everybody so that everybody feels ownership over those ideas, right? Mm-hmm. And then uh, coordinating with everybody to make sure that the idea is technically sound. Okay, this is the best way of implementing it. And it works for these departments. And it, yeah, it's it's complicated, right? But um, yeah, like through that politicking, sometimes you can get everybody on the same page with the same idea. And uh, it can be a really awesome idea, you know? Yeah. And you can do some cool shit with it. So, um, I mean, yeah. I, I say the politics side of stuff is sometimes I think is removing the human aspect of it. Um, sometimes when you've got, like, say, you know, there's 10 ideas thrown into a barrel. You sort of have to remove the fact that it's come from someone and just look at the idea on its own without any context for who it's come from. And yeah. sort of go, is it a good idea on its And it's easy to, and this is the problem, is I think when you do something like that, where you remove the human aspect of it, and you sort of assess the idea and you say you just decide it's it's just not feasible, it's easy for it to be put down to, oh, that's just politics, and that's just because of who I am or, you know, the position I'm in. And quite often it is just you you remove the human aspect is it a good idea yes or no and like you said does it contribute to all these pillars of the game no well okay irrelevant of who it came it could have come from the CEO for all we know you know yeah. it it just it doesn't work it's not a good idea um, but it's very easy for people to label that as oh that's just politics and stuff and I think that's where there's a bit of misconception with the idea of what politics is within sort of the game development yeah yeah but uh- yeah, sorry, man. My my brain is. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, sorry, man. I, dude, you're doing a, me a solid by being on so early in the morning. You're a brave person. Well, I, uh, no, like last last night I had, uh, I was I, like I'm working on this this new product. Mm-hmm. Oh, hi, wifey. Sorry, my my wife is uh, that's cool. Just getting ready for work. Um, yeah, I was, I'm working on this new project in Unreal and. It's like it's really technical. It's more like kind of shader stuff, kind of mm-hmm. like uh, we were talking about before. And I actually find when I go to bed, like if if I work on it super late, which I think I was working on it till like I don't know, twelve o'clock or something last night or eleven o'clock, some. Uh, but I have dreams about it, mm-hmm. <laughs> and like in my dreams, I'll actually be solving mathematical equations or like figuring out the best way of doing something, and. And then I wake up and I keep waking up and I keep thinking about it, you know? Do you ever have that? Oh, God, I, I, you've just hit on exactly the problem I have. If I do anything shade out or substance based before I go to sleep, I basically, I won't have a good night's sleep because I'm just like, yeah. I'll walk away from my PC, so I'll be like, I'll, I'll find a milestone within the project to be like, right, I'll just sort of stop here. Go to sleep and I'm like, oh shit, that's how I do that. Oh crap, I need to do it now. No, I can't do it now, I'm in bed. Okay, uh, <laughs> and but if I go to bed after like I don't know scooped in some rock or something like that I sleep like a baby I'm fine if I do anything where I'm actually having to actively think and work out problems I am not in for a good night's sleep at all yeah it's it's like the the satisfaction of like finding the answer to a big math equation Mm. like you get that but like your brain has to like kind of go into overdrive to figure out all the potential solutions to it. So like it's like it's just really hard to put the genie back in the bottle once it's come <laughs> out. Like you need like a couple hours kind of thing. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. That's that's where I'm at right now. <laughs> I can complete. It's weird just saying that. Yeah, I can completely relate to that problem. You've, actually, this is quite an interesting segue. So talking about the technical side of stuff. Um, Obviously, you have some really cool um, shader packs online. I, I mean, actually, I first came across you from Tim Simpson. Um, he did his oh, nice. R Station Challenge. And yeah. I hit him up like, dude, that moss on the roof of your, um, of your feudal Japan buildings. Like, how did you do that? That's sick. He's like, well, actually, it's funny you say that. It's from this guy. And I come across your R Station. I was like, holy shit. This, these are some cool shaders. Oh, like, cool. Thanks, what, man. How 
do you go, what was your learning resource for that? And what I mean by learning resources, how did you go about developing and figuring out these shaders? Aside from, you know, the years of experience, was it you observed the people stuff or did you just sit and experiment and try, have a problem and try to figure out within a shader? Like what's the process to get from point A to point B of having these awesome shaders that you know so well that you're able to then, you know, sell to uh, the masses on you know, stores like Gumroad and stuff like uh, that? Well, I think it was, it was mainly just like experimentation in my, my spare time. Mm -hmm. um, just like, I don't know, I, there's so many tutorials out there online like you can literally like oh i want to make a a blinking hologram light <laughs> you know like you can go find like the most obscure things and like people have all these tutorials that show you the basics of using the material editor right so mm -hmm. like in my spare time i just sat at home like playing around with that stuff and you know eventually i got a little bit better and you know i started being able to think for myself as to like mm -hmm. what the best solutions to the the problems would be for depending on what I wanted to create and uh, yeah just went from there I think like I've been doing it pretty heavily for like the past like two year year and a half something like that mm -hmm. um, and then yeah whenever I hit a snag I, I would just like go on the Unreal Development Network on Facebook and then I'll like I'll post a question and that's actually like a wicked resource because like what a lot of people will do when whenever they hit like a technical snag they'll you know they'll sit there for like two days trying to figure it out and then they mm -hmm. they'll stop because <laughs> yeah. like it just the pro oh i don't care screw it right and uh but it, really like it, it's pretty cool like i i'll post a question in that group and you'll get like 10 people that are like they're just there they're stoked to help like yeah 10 like super solid technical people with like different answers and sometimes the different answers have different strengths to them like it it's it's a pretty awesome group so i i would say like like in terms of advice like just don't hesitate to ask somebody <laughs> that mm -hmm. might know the solution right like during so, your development you said about the tutorials and i'm just curious because this might mirror what happened with me with substance designer did you find like when you're using tutorials for your learning resource you're sort of steadily progressing and then it's like an exponential curve where, right, I want to just sort of play on my own in the graph editor and just figure out these problems without, you know, following it step by step. For me, it was like when I was following tutorials where it was like, you know, for designer, here's how you do this material, you do this, and then you do this, and you put these numbers in and you get X, Y, Z. As soon as I stopped following them so precisely and I just went off and started experimenting on my own, my understanding of the software and my development, you know, sped up a lot. Was that the same for you with Unreal Light? you're following tutorials and you're progressing, but then when you start like just really messing on your own in the editor, you sort of, your understanding and your progression went through the roof. Oh yeah, yeah, totally. But like, I, I don't know, like it, you definitely need like a bit of breathing room at the start to just yeah. like wrap your mind around like the basic, like a lot of the time it's like the basic interface or like understanding of what some of the basic nodes do, you know? Yeah, your uh, bread and butter but, sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, like uh, once you've kind of built up that like foundation of like, uh, you know, what what everything in the program kind of means. And by everything, I mean like a tenth of it a lot of the time. Like yeah. you don't <laughs> need to know those tiny little details of what that thing does. But um, yeah, I'd say just like work on the foundation of learning a program through tutorials. But once you've kind of understood that, then you can start experimenting and then you can start playing around with your own thing. And if you hit a snag, just go look online there's always some solution to almost any problem right yeah i have to admit i um my crutch is always the the, the donity discord because they have like a troubleshooting channel and the amount of times i've had a, like a ridiculous error in, in real which is like you know the sort of errors where you're like this feels like there's a really obvious tick box somewhere which i'm just not aware of and i posted it, someone like yeah press press g and i'll, I'll, press g, and I'll fix it and i'm like oh for <laughs> jesus christ come on like, you know, you bash your head against the wall for like a couple of hours and these outside communities, you know, so Dynasty or the, the, the Facebook one you mentioned, they could just give you that, that one little bit of information. It's just like, oh yeah, like, oh, yeah. fix it. Yeah, like at most of the time, there's always like some little, it's exactly what you said. Like, like there's a couple things that haven't been ironed out. Like, uh, you know, have it, sorry, just to get technical for a second, mm -hmm. like having say like two physical materials on the same mesh. Yeah. <laughs> You know, like maybe there is a solution to that, but I haven't found it. 
Um, but yeah, yeah, there, the, there's usually always a solution, right? What's some of the, uh, so you've obviously had a lot of experience in the shaders. Um, is there any like interesting, um, I don't want to call them tips, but you know what I mean? Like, oh, there's a really cool technique where if you do this, 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 it can, you can do this. Is there anything like that which you found that you found off your own, you know, exploration? Is there anything like that you can think of off the top of your head? Um, nothing that I can really think of off the top of my head. Like, I, I think there's a lot of kind of hidden gems in mm -hmm. uh, in the material editor. Like, uh, they have like all these different functions that you can use for different things. Like, like the you know how Tim did the moss, yeah. right? Uh, that's that's literally it's it's a material function called world aligned blend. <laughs> it's in Unreal. It's like a material function that you like drag out from the thing. It's like whoa, all whoa, the math. That it's the one. So I could do the normal direction stuff. So I ha I made a shader with like snow where like snow was built up on top. There's a node yeah. which has all of that inside it. Yeah. Oh, that sucks. <laughs> yeah, but no, no. Like that's that's the thing, right? Like you kind of <laughs> you kind of need to do the tu the tutorial on how to make it. To even yeah. understand what's going on, like and and even when I say like oh like use the material functions in Unreal, it's like, well it kind of defeats the purpose of like learning how to use the the material mm -hmm. editor, right? Because you're like basically taking a pre-made shader network and popping it into your your material, yeah. right? Yeah. So like it it's like if you want to learn, sometimes you got to do it yourself. But like there's there's a few things in there that like you literally just pop some things in there and if you know what you're doing and know what nodes to plug into them it takes like five minutes to build uh, something you know come on break my heart there's gonna be what what else <laughs> the, the, now that that's that that's kind of i'm not broken hearted but i'm um uh there's a i think there's a solid five six days of frustration when i was like sort of refusing to use outside tutorials i was like i need to figure this out for myself and i, I had it working but now <laughs> there's one node for it so whatever little jabs are there like that, or there's gonna be some better with some other ones. Uh in in Unreal specifically? Yeah, let's talk just just Unreal for now. Uh I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I've put you on a spot here. Yeah, like I I don't know, man. Like in, in the material letter, like I, I could say that you know, I could say like, oh, use the grid. <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know what i mean like yeah i don't i don't know man like like i i was playing around with uh like real-time gi the other day mm -hmm. and it, by playing around i mean like i turned it on and then i just wanted to see and like it looks beautiful but it's like like your frame rates tanks down the crapper like immediately <laughs> like I think for me it was like like I have I have like a beast computer because like I do all my my personal work on it mm -hmm. and uh, yeah I think it was like it was like 30, 30 frames drop or forty frame drop or so, something like that so uh, I was like well like in terms of like making like films with Unreal this this makes sense or like yeah. screenshots with Unreal this makes sense but like it just it wasn't there for games and it, no, yes no. I know I'm kind of going off on this weird tangent right no, now no no follow it um well actually yeah, like, what about um I'm just curious have you spent much time looking at um stuff you could do to shader with distance fields because I've only just recently stumbled across distance fields um through Unreal Lightning Academy, uh, I saw him mention it and I was like, okay, let's have a look at this. And I started looking at like stuff influencing dithering using the distance fields rather than the normal dithering and stuff like yeah. that. Have you spent much time looking at that sort of stuff? Uh yeah, yeah, I actually like in my in my new shader, like I, I put it in there. I, I don't really like it. Mm -hmm. Like I, it's it's actually like a genius way of of creating um, material stuff. Bye bye Pete. <laughs> Sorry, I got got my. Nah, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, it's it's actually like a, a genius way of of uh, creating a material for something, right? Oh, it, it blends between like it's a, for those that don't know what you're we're talking about. Like it, it's basically like you have a rock, you turn this edge dither on, and then when you put the rock through the terrain, it it uses like a dithered alpha and mm -hmm. kind of like fades your rock, the edges where your rock crashes through the landscape. Uh, so it, it's good for blending things into other things. That's mm -hmm. that's what you're talking about, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, like it's it's really really expensive. 
Yes. <laughs> it it adds a hundred instructions to your material. So like just for context, like I all have like a material that has like it has detail maps, it has world space mapping, it has like a breakup mask that has a blah blah blah. It's this material that's really expensive. That'll be about two hundred instructions. A base material in Unreal, like with nothing in it, is a hundred instructions, right? So this it'll boost your your material up to like if I have a really expensive material, it'll bring it up to three hundred instructions, which is like yeah. it's pretty brutal, <laughs> you know. When, when your component and, shaders, yeah, that breaks your heart when you accidentally tweak something and it's like, right, go component shaders now, and I'm like, oh shit. Yeah, yeah, but it, like another thing about it is like um, you have to actually uh, turn off the distance field on your mesh for it to work properly. Yeah, that's really annoying. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I, that's the problem I had for a long time and I was literally, I was in uh, the Discord in voice chat with screen share on with like me and uh, four other guys. And I'm just like, why is this not working? This should be working. And I'm like, have you tried this? And we go through and I'm on like the world settings on everything, just trying to, trying to fix this. And it was just a checkbox within the yeah, yeah, material yeah, in object. I was just like, shit. <laughs> it's one of those problems <laughs> that we were talking about before. There's just some magical checkbox somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's, I, I can't remember. Maybe I might be wrong about this, but like, I'm pretty sure like if you're using dynamic lighting with it, it's like, if you don't uncheck that effect distance field, like it basically just screws up <laughs> your distance yeah. field on your mesh. Yeah. Yeah, so it it's is. like, your your distance field ambient occlusion which gets rendered with uh with a dynamic light or a dynamic skylight it'll it'll just like it makes it go whack it gets, <laughs> so, you get all the big black spots on it don't you you get like a uh, random yeah of it. yeah and it, it just it basically like it, you know like a lot of the time like if it's like a big background rock or something like you're not gonna yeah. notice but i don't know you don't you don't put in uh an edge blend on something if you want to see it in the background, right? No, exactly. <laughs> so it's it's just like it's just this really expensive shader method, and there's yeah yeah you can see a bit of blending, but like I don't know in my mind it's not worth it. Like in our game, we turned it off. <laughs> yeah. Do you prefer skirt meshing and stuff like that then um, to hide the uh, transitions? It, to to be honest, like like whenever I do art, like a lot of the time. I just don't care about detail like <laughs> and it, like I I think like a lot of that's actually a problem I see with uh, a lot of 3d artists like they'll create like an environment and they'll make like a prop and like the prop will like have individual bolts modeled but mm -hmm. like when you assemble all the props and see it in the like the entire scope of the environment like it's the composition looks bad but like that one mesh if you zoom in super close on it it looks it looks gorgeous right but like yeah. when you're playing a game you never see those details like everybody's like literally you see like 95 percent of people playing god of war they're like running through and then they oh, oh that's a pretty sky in the back oh okay and then they continue oh wow it looks great it's like i think people just need to focus a lot more on like the macro instead of the micro like just like how does the environment feel when you walk through it and mm -hmm. like that's kind of something that like uh, like I always try to get like level artists to do is like actually play the game because mm -hmm. like most of the time they're just working on that one little corner and you know they'll they'll make like a table and then they'll put like all the bottles and the beakers and whatever else on the table I'm like put the table in put like three beakers on it done yeah <laughs> like you know what, it's nobody's really, gonna care this yeah. this is exactly what Marcel I was talking to Marcel on a previous podcast uh, from the lead artist from Crytek. And he was, yeah. we were talking about this, about like level of detail of props. And the problem he, he was talking about is with less experienced artists, they want to make every prop, like the barrel next to a door, like be the best prop in the world. And it's yeah. like, but that level of detail, like saving it for the hero props is like that. It's, it comes from experience, being able, being able to say, this is the bit that needs all the detail because that's what players focusing on. And a lack of detail on other stuff almost helps focus the player in. It's part of the user journey. Oh but yeah. It's kind of hard. Like, I mean, I suffer from it, you know, with my, with my safe house scene. Every single prop was like, uh, you know, I sat and made and thought about and all this sort of stuff. By the time I went to the renders, half of them were either in black because of shadows, or yeah. you see glancing shots of, so the roughness overrides whatever you're looking at anyway. 
But it's yeah. really, I have to admit, it is hard because that's my biggest downfall. Is like I get tunnel vision and stuff. I just want to make something look really, really cool in the uh, in the viewport, and then you take it to the engine. It's like, ah, uh, yeah, I don't even see this prop. This this is not good. Yeah, I I think like it's like it's also a question of scope. It's like yeah. doing those heavy detail props. Like, and you know, we're all artists. We want to make something cool. That's a that's why we're in the game industry in general, right? Like, we just mm-hmm. we we want to hone that one thing and every piece of art that we put in the game, we want it to be special. Right. And you know, I'm, I'm the same, like I, I have the same instinct to do that, but it's like, I think it, it's, yeah, it's, it's just taking like a big picture on everything actually costs way less too. Right. Like it'll, it'll take you half the time to make your prop. Uh, the amount of polys that you have on your mesh will be like half because you didn't model all those tiny little bolts. <laughs> uh, and yeah, it'll be less distracting a lot of the time because I get, you know, like 90% of what focuses you uh, in a game, like on the composition is like the placement of things and the lighting and the colors. Mm-hmm. So like, it's like that tiny little detail, like no one's even going to see it. So like, uh, like a, anybody that's like trying to do environment art like yeah do you know what if if you're doing your portfolio like have a couple nice props like really nice props that emphasize that you can make detail if you want but if you're making a whole environment like i i would focus like mainly on the lighting first the lighting Mm -hmm. and the level art first making sure like everything works it directs you your eye can follow things and you know where to go Uh, like that's a lot more important in in my opinion you know what, this, this is a really funny little segue, well, sort of roundabout, I should say, because it's going back to what we were talking about at the beginning uh, with 2D art, like, you know, you suggest stuff and the viewer sort of fills in the gaps. I suppose it's the same with the, it, when it's done well, it comes back to the 3D stuff you were talking about, you know, you don't need this table with a crazy amount of props and scientific experiment going on, a couple of beakers and cups and you've suggested what's happening. The player yeah. sort of makes the connection and they move on. It's... Yeah almost the exact same I suppose to what the 2D art's doing where it's like you know vague brush strokes which suggest everything and you as a viewer interpret it and fill in the gaps oh yeah yeah totally like I don't know I, I guess it just depends on how far you want to take something right like and and like if you focus on those big details first like the lighting and the composition you'll you'll get something that will look better faster and then if you have the time, you can work on those little details later. And and because you've already done the composition and the lighting, you'll know where you need to focus your detail. Because exactly like you said, like, oh, that table, oh, maybe it's in shade in the corner and you, you don't even see it in your shot, right? So like, oh, okay, well, the sky on the other hand, it takes up like 60% of my frame. So I have to have like a dope looking sky, right? Like. It's like analyzing your frame in terms of like real estate space, right? Mm-hmm. Like a, where, where am I going to get the most bang for my buck and where do I need to focus my detail so that it works in terms of the amount of time that I want to devote to this? But like, I don't know, if you're some guy in his, his basement working on his own scene and you just want to make something dope, then yeah, yeah. focus detail wherever you want, right? But I, I just like, if you're trying to economize which I think everybody should because doing things fast and doing them properly is probably like one of the, well, they're two of the most important things. So. Yeah. yeah. I, think it was, I think that comes a lot down to experience as well because like now with my scenes, that like it's funny you actually you hit it now on the head earlier. You know, the, obviously we block out. I always, you know, everyone blocks out. That's where you start. But I also set up at the very beginning of my scene when I block out, I'll set up my like free key shots and I won't really think of anything other than free key shots. Like say for example at the moment I'm doing it, um, I managed to do a piece of concept art and I'm going to make the con- concept art key shot on two of us and it's like of a cabin in the woods. I'm not going to worry yeah. for what's behind the cabin, what's the side of the cabin, what's off in the bush somewhere. It's like I'm going to make that key shot look as good as possible and what I'll do is block it out, I'll block the lighting in and the the composition and then that's all I focus on and I think when yeah. you're earlier in your career like, and like I'm going to use my safe house as an example I was just thinking of it as a 3D space I wasn't thinking about it as um, absorbing it and interpreting it as a viewer so I was making all these yeah. crazy little props and I was just like which never got sold because I wasn't thinking of it as how am I actually going to view this scene I was just like I'm just it's got to be a scene it's got to be filled 
I think that only comes with experience because I don't think until you do that, until you go through that absolute ball ache of like making all these props and you know bashing your head against brick wall and all that sort of stuff, until you feel that pain, I don't think you'll appreciate the fact that you need to save time. Yeah, uh, yeah, totally. Like I, I think like for people that are like getting into the the industry, they they tend to to focus on all the details right and then they get bogged down by the details when they're working on a scene and then they don't complete their scene (laughs) because they're too focused on these tiny like all the tiny little things that barely uh affect the the composition of the the shot right so like it's also like a question of motivation like how can i like if if i view a scene as being insurmountable to create because it's just way too much work because I'm too focused on the details, I'm not going to want to make that scene, you know, like unless, you know, unless I do and I really like detailing (laughs) things, you know, and I have endless time and endless resources to accomplish my goal. Right. Then, yeah, that makes sense. But like the other for the other 99 percent of people, (laughs) like it'll actually just help help you be motivated to complete it if you actually feel like you can right yeah that's a very good point yeah hmm. yeah that's actually no, that, that last bit where it is it's that's probably the most important bit is feeling like you can complete it I haven't actually heard anyone say that before and that's a very easy way to sort of quantify it for people it's like make sure you can feel like you can complete the scene because if you don't you won't well it, I think it. that's also like a, it's like a fine line right? yeah because like Sorry, I'm just I'm losing my train of thought. <laughs> I think that's, cool. that's that's like a fine line, but like you're. Uh, yeah, sorry, man. Yeah, don't apologize. It's cool. It's cool. <laughs> no, it's dude. It's, I was like, it's a really I interesting it. idea. I had it. It's a really interesting idea. I I just I think it's something that um. When you start a project, you know, it's easy to. What's the word like? set all these crazy goals you know you're when you start a project you've got all the motivation and you're like yeah i'm gonna do this crazy scene with four massive rooms and the outside is gonna all be dynamic light and all the props are gonna be unique and i'm gonna have this crazy shader network and you end up stretching yourself in and like when that motivation runs out or that sort of the the energy runs out and you actually look at the task you set ahead of yourself it can be like really daunting but if you set like be very realistic with it and do then things like you know focus on the block out of the light and the composition yeah it feels way more achievable so you're just working the composition this little box i've got this 90 20 by 1080 space i've got to finish to that that's all i've got to do it just yeah. that's what helps me is that thinking that's that space is all that needs to be finished anything else on top is just cherry on the cake oh yeah yeah totally but lincoln dude we've been go- i can't believe this is the past few podcasts have just flown by like we've been in talk for an hour already I don't even know how we managed that um, I don't know how much you listen but I'm going to throw what I throw to every single uh, guest is if you could speak to yourself when you're you know, young, starting out in a career with all your experience you've gathered over the years what advice would you give to yourself? Oh, I'm sorry <laughs> I, I, I like to put everyone on the spot for this one it's always interesting uh uh, I don't. I don't know. I'd. I'd probably say like, just, just do what you. For me, I'm trying to think of like young me. Mm-hmm. I, I'd probably say like just, just do what you like, because <laughs> like a a lot of people they'll they'll just they'll get into things because they think that they need to learn them or blah, 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 right? Oh, mm-hmm. I want to become an environment artist, so I need to learn substance. But it's like, you know, environment art is like, there's 20 different categories that you could potentially flow into. And a lot of people just choose one because, oh, they think that it's going to be the most profitable or blah, 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 right? But, mm-hmm. and I think that's something that I actually did really good is I just, I, I've always kind of gone where the wind takes me. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like with the, the concept art thing, the technical art thing, like all that. And uh, I think because I was like so interested in it and so passionate like that, that's actually motivated me to continue learning, right? So 
I don't know. I, I would just, I would say do what you love doing. Like, I, I know that's like the most like slapstick <laughs> cliche yeah, yeah, thing that I could is. actually say, but it a lot is, of people, people don't, don't do, do that, right? Yeah, exactly. They don't do it. That, it, it it's funny because everyone says that. They're like, oh, it sounds really cliche. And I'm like, yeah, but for some reason, people still don't listen. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, and, and anytime I haven't listened to that, I just, I end up not liking my life. <laughs> and like it, that that doesn't necessarily like just apply to to the game industry or whatever right but i i think in terms of the game industry it's like you know a lot of people always they complain about not having motivation and maybe that's cuz they're not doing what what they need to or like mm-hmm. what they're they're passionate about right mm-hmm. um but I, I don't know maybe it's more complicated than that because artists motivation and artists are all crazy so that's very true we are all crazy but we all love each other as well but yeah Lincoln I, I thank you so much for coming on like I said I know you've gone out of the way to do this and I know everyone listening is going to appreciate this hearing some stuff you had to say um, so yeah thanks a, a ton for coming on so I've been looking forward to speaking to you for a long time yeah thanks um, a lot man so everyone listening um, the platforms this podcast is available on is YouTube Spotify SoundCloud and uh, Apple iTunes um, please like, follow, share, subscribe, all of that sort of jazz because it helps it grow the podcast and helps reach more people. Um, but yeah, we're going to wrap up. Lincoln, thanks so much for coming on, man. Hey, thanks a lot, man. All right, peace out, guys. <laughs>